resources and also the risks that our regional water resources pose to the mine. And I thought rather than going into a lot of depth about one particular topic, which might, uh, many of you might find a bit um, difficult and boring, I thought I would give more of an overview of what we do, and in particular talk about some of the PhD students' work. Um, so I've got uh, three projects to go over, potentially four if, if I do it quickly. Um, and then if, if you're interested in any of them, then we can have a talk about it uh, afterwards, or you can contact the PhD students. Uh, so first of all, just, just a bit more about uh, the scope of water and mining, and more broadly what we do in SWIMI. So you, if you think about the relationship of water and mining, you can think about it being in terms of the engineering and technology side, and much of that you actually do here in JPMRC, thinking about um, saving water in, in flotation processes and thickening processes, things like that. We don't do much of that in, in swimming. Uh, second one, the environmental aspects, and that's what we really focus on. And, and thirdly, social, legal, and economic uh, aspects of water management. Um, so that's just some examples of uh, potential um, research areas in each of these three categories. And um, the, the red ones there are really the ones that, that we've been focusing on the most. And the blue ones are ones that we've been involved with, um, partly through collaborations with CSRM and other centers and groups. Um, things that we really don't touch upon, water law and regulation and, and impermeable barriers, water and wastewater treatment. Uh, this is just uh, examples of uh, a list of um, current and, and recent projects that I've been involved with. And, and actually probably 60% um, of the research we do in SWIMI is through RHD projects. So it's really important to us. Um, because we do sort of short-term research for, for companies and for government and for NGOs, as you see there. Um, but really, the, the real meat of our research is these uh, RHD projects, which, as you know, can last anywhere between two and, and four years. Okay, so the first project I'm going to cover is, is the PhD of Melinda Hilton and, um, and actually Karen has um, just started his PhD to take over Melinda's work. And this is also funded by uh, an ACAR project. And this is led by um, Ansar Ibraki from CMLR. And my role in the project in particular has been the numerical modeling aspects of, of that. So that's what I'm going to lead towards in the next few slides. So the background to this project is uh, coal mining in Queensland. And uh, coal mines uh, generate a lot of uh, overburdened waste material. Uh, which they dump into big uh, rock piles next to the mine pit. And one of the issues with this is that um, it generates potentially quite a lot of salt. And the generation of salt is a natural process, that's why our oceans are, are so salty. Um, but the, um, the blasting um, and the dumping of this uh, overburdened material um, exposes much more of the rock to weathering processes, and therefore you accelerate the, the rate of generation of the salt. This ends up potentially in the environment and in our drinking water, and that's when it becomes a cost to our society. Um, so in, in their closure plans, mining companies are required to make predictions of how much salt they're going to generate, uh, what the concentrations are going to be in the pit lakes, and how much of the salt is going to be released to the environment. Um, and their problem is how to make these predictions, and that's what we're, we're helping them with. Um, so we, we, we're looking at uh, uh, waste rock from three uh, sample mine sites in, in central Queensland. And um, what we did was we got uh, IBC uh, containers, which are about one meter times one meter times one meter. And then we get fresh soil from the mine sites. Uh, the mine company puts it directly into the IBC and puts it on a truck and takes it to Punjara Hills. Uh, where, we have, where we have this experimental uh, facility. Uh, so the idea is uh, to get um, as representative a range of spoils from around Queensland as possible. And um, <clears throat> we've just been refunded by ACARP to actually uh, extend the, the breadth of that uh, sample. And that's what Karan is going to be helping with us with in, in his PhD. Um, so we measure. Uh, salt, um, as you saw in the previous slide, is, has a very broad definition, 
And we measure about 25 um, ions, concentration of ions in these experiments, uh, focusing on the six major ions which make up the, um, the, the, the primary amounts of total dissolved uh, solid. Um, so this is, this is the experimental work, and um, this um, has primarily been uh, Mansour and, and Melinda's uh, work. Um, so they've been running uh, laboratory scale uh, leaching tests, which you see up at the top right there. Uh, so it's kind of traditional column tests you do in the laboratory. So uh, when you pass water through the, the crushed spoil, you measure how much salt comes out at the bottom. And you can do that under different um, wet and drying cycles to get the effect of moisture. And then Melinda's also been doing uh, weathering experiments where she takes a sample of each spoil uh, leaves it exposed to the environment for a period of uh, almost two years now, and then actually uh, measures how the, uh, the spoil degrades. Uh, but to me, the most interesting part of the experiment is, is the IBC scale tests, because these are the tests actually providing an at scale measurement of the amount of salt being generated from these waste drops. So, in other words, the, uh, the particle size distribution in the IBCs is supposed to represent the particle size distribution in the actual. Uh, waste rock pumps. Uh, so these are set up at, uh, IBC, at uh, Pinjara Hills with three different types of spoils and under three different types of uh, moisture regime. One where they're kept saturated for almost all the time, uh, one where they're unsaturated for most of the time, and one under natural environmental uh, conditions. Uh, so the hypotheses behind this are first of all uh, if we uh, do this experiment for a long time, uh, first of all, you'll get, um, you'll get some um, high generation of salt rates and um, quite dynamic. And then it will start to settle down over periods of months. And then at some point, it will reach what we call a quasi-steady state, where for practical purposes, you can assume that salt being generated from this oil pile is, is constant for the purpose of, of design and prediction. The other hypothesis is that um, we can actually predict this. So I can actually build uh, numerical models at these IBC scales that will actually tell us what this rate is and when it starts to happen. And then the third hypothesis is that we can actually do this um, using uh, by upscaling the parameters that we get from the laboratory scale experiments. And that's important, of course, because this kind of setup is far too expensive to do for uh, every mine in Queensland. Uh, what we can afford to do is these smaller scale laboratory experiments. Um, so there's a huge amount of work involved with this, and uh, you need to speak to uh, Mansour Mahanda if you want to um, go into details. There's one, uh, just a picture of one of the IBCs at Pinjara Hills. Okay, so numerical modeling, which has really been my part of this uh, project. Um, so this is just an illustration of the numerical model of the IBC. Um, so it's uh, disaggregated vertically into uh, any number of layers you want. And then conceptually, the mass of spoil is split up into uh, weatherable components, uh, soluble salts, and salts that are actually dissolved and mobilized. And then there's a hydraulic model that predicts the amount of flow coming out, and then a geochemical model that predicts the amount of salt coming out. And the geochemical model is extremely simple. Uh, because I like simple models, uh, basically consists of a weathering rate that applies to all the spoil, and then a mobilization rate that only applies to the saturated uh, volume of the spoil. Um, so in terms of uh, the hypothesis that we can actually use the laboratory scale parameters to, to successfully run these models, um, so actually um, that, that seems to be true for these weathering parameters. So I just took the weathering parameters we derived straight from the lab. I put them into this model and it seemed to work quite well in terms of performance. It doesn't work so well for these mobilization parameters because they're very specific to the, the hydraulic and moisture conditions in, in the particular experiment you're doing, which are quite a bit different between the lab and the, and the IBC scale. Now this is just some uh, illustrations of uh, the observed leaching rates, so that's the, the loading rate of salt coming out of these IBCs to the modeled ones, and you can see that um, it's, uh, it's uh, close, um, close in the context of uh, what we regard as, as close in this type of uh, model. 
so this is quite promising. However, uh, we do have significant more research to do in how we actually uh, more um, reliably upscale these parameters from the lab scale to the, um, to the true scale. And furthermore, um, we don't pretend that this I C scale uh, represents very well the, the actual um, spoil pile because that has a different hydraulic regime again. So there's some work to do in that uh, final stage of the upscale and some significant work. Uh, once you have this model, you can uh, replace our artificial moisture regime that we impose with a natural moisture regime uh, under environmental conditions. And because we have records of uh, climate over the last 130 years or so, we can actually drive it using that historical climate uh, to some kind of, uh, give some kind of indication of uh, how the spoil would respond on the timescales that the mine companies have to predict into the future. Uh, so this is what I've done using this initial um, model, and so uh, this is the um, this is the the loading rate of spoil uh, at a daily simulation scale, and this is aggregating it to an annual scale. And you can sort of judge from this that after about uh, 50 years or so, you reach what we call this quasi steady condition, where there isn't really statistically any uh, trends in the in the loading rate. Um, so th this is what, if we can uh, actually um, produce this kind of result um, and, and, and validate the mod that models are producing something that can, can be regarded as, as, as meaningful, uh, then this uh, we hope will be very valuable to the companies and their closure on it. Okay, the second project is something quite different. This is the PhD of Juan Osa Moreno, who has uh, submitted his PhD and is awaiting examination. Um, and this is about um, regional water resources and um, demands for water, including mine water demands, and, and trying to estimate in the future how much deficits there will be, and then what that means in terms of um, the economics for the mine and for the other water users in the region. And also thinking about um, if the mine implements um, water saving measures or invest in water infrastructure, um, not just what economic benefits will that have to the mine, but what economic benefits it might have to all the other water users in the catchment. Just as a bit of introduction uh, to water economics, uh, this is a graph of uh, how much uh, people pay for water over different um, regions in the USA and in Chile. So red is Chile and blue is the USA, and uh, uh, this is US dollars per liter per second. So this is based on trading data. This is people actually buying rights for water. So uh, it's pretty obvious to see that in wet regions um, like Bio Bio in, in Chile, people are, are not really willing to be anything for water because there's so much to it practically free. Whereas at the other end of the extreme in Antofagasta, which is a very arid mining region in Chile, uh, people pay an awful lot for water. Uh, remarkably, 700,000 US dollars for a litre per second of water. A litre per second of water isn't very much. If any of you turned on the taps in your house, uh, all the taps in your house, you'd probably get about a litre a second of water out. Uh, now, the economics of, of what, why people pay so much for water are, are quite, um, quite straightforward, but because uh, for a mine company which is short of water, it would only take them about a year to get a return on that investment. So in other words, a whole year of mine company's profits, uh, we'd pay for that, um, that one litre of second of water which they've got in perpetuity. Uh, that's assuming, of course, that they actually um, can access that water because uh, buying the right to the water and actually being able to access it, access it in Chile are, are two different things. Um, and just for another bit of context, um, Escondida Mine has recently invested uh, a lot, uh, about three and a half billion dollars in um, in uh, seawater supply, and we'll come back to that later. Uh, but that's actually three times that amount. Okay, so so mining companies are, are willing to invest well above the market value to ensure they've got a, a sustainable supply of water. I'll come back to that uh, later. This is just a bit of context. So Juan's case study was the Aconcagua region in, in Chile, which is quite a bit further south than Antofagasta, so it's not in such a, an arid area, it's in a semi-arid area. Uh, there's still significant water shortages. Um, so this is the Aconcagua River Basin. Uh, it goes all the way from the, the high Andes here right to the coast, and, and Juan focused on the, the upper region here. And he focused on this region for um, 
a number of reasons. The principal ones are the mines are up here, and so the potential area of influence of the mine in terms of its, its water use is more is more in the upland part of the catchment. And if you go down here, you start to get more into areas where you use a lot of groundwater, and that's um, very difficult for us to include in our models. Uh, now just on, this is the Google Earth image, which focuses even more on the upper part of this study area. So the mine, you see there's Andina mine here, so this is actually the mine pit, and just over the ridge is the uh, Los Bronces mine. Um, and then these are, the, these are the tailing storage facilities down in the valley. These, these are about uh, two and a half thousand meters further down the, the valley than, than the mines. Um, both these mines are quite reliant on uh, precipitation uh, and snow melt in this um, in this upper part of the catchment, and and what that means is is the mines because that's such a small area they're very susceptible to local scale fluctuations in the climate. And both mines have suffered both from floods and from droughts in the past few years. Their reliance on snow melt is also important because it means they're susceptible to climate change impacts. Um, Precipitation in this area is forecast to reduce a bit, but the main impact is going to be increases in temperatures and therefore uh, changes in the snow melt uh, regime. Uh, the, the tailings are interesting as well because they're so much further down the valley. It's uh, in the past it's not been economical to pump the water back up to the mine. So as you know, a lot of, a lot of water decants out the tailings. Uh, many, if not most, mines will actually recirculate that water. It's difficult here because they're because they're so far down from the mines. The reason why the tailings aren't up here is just because there's, uh, these valleys are so, so steep uh, and it's a seismic, seismically active area. It just wouldn't be safe to put such big tailings facilities up there. Uh, so we'll come back, we'll come back to the, the reuse of that tailings water a bit later as well. So the first bit of work we did on this was a number of years ago now with Rodrigo Pavea, who's an engineer, was an engineer at the time for Andina Mine. He did his masters with us, and he basically looked at um, improving the resilience of the Andina Mine to climate change and climate variability, um, and came up with a conclusion. So he did a cost-benefit analysis of a number of water supply options, and came up with the conclusion that actually recirculating the tailings water from down in the valley up to the mine was the best solution, because it's the one that pretty much guarantees that um, the mine water demand is going to be covered no matter what the future climate variability is like. So Juan, in his PhD, was interested in this result and interested in, in the question, well, this gives a lot of benefit to the mine potentially, what benefit might it give to the other water users in the catchment? So Juan uh, developed this uh, model of the, the upper Aconcagua. So that's the same outline that you saw before. Um, and, and this is developing this kind of model. So the purpose of this model is basically just to, excuse me, is basically just to estimate the uh, water demand, the water supply, and therefore the water deficit that each of the main water users have. And the main water users of the mine, the hydroelectric plants, uh, which are shown in, in green squares there, um, and the uh, agriculture and the uh, and some urban supplies. So there's four main water users. Each of them experiences uh, shortfalls in water supply. <coughs> this is a challenging area to model because the, 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 the climate gradients uh, are very, very steep. So in other words, the, the, the precipitation and temperature vary an awful lot between up here, which is the, the Andes, and down here, which is the valley. And that means that uh, to do a meaningful model, you need to have quite high spatial resolution so you pick up these uh, strong gradients. And this caused by a lot of problems because actually the, the quality of the climate data sets there aren't really good enough to support this high resolution modeling. So he spent a lot of time actually developing methods to interpolate climate variables um, to support this. And then he spent a lot of time developing this model to ensure that he got, he got the relevant supply nodes and the demand nodes represented in the model. Um, so just um, the kind of results that this model produces is it, it, for each of the main water users, it, it 
gives you the, the amount of water demand that's actually covered by the supply. So for example, you can see the, the mining here, 90% um, of its water demand is, is provided by the country. And then, uh, and then urban has, has uh, the priority. Uh, people always have the priority for taking water, so that's got much uh, higher coverage. Now, in terms of the economics of this, um, so we attach to this water uh, supply demand model uh, an economic model, which is basically about uh, how much uh, revenue is generated for each of these users per unit of water used. So the, uh, the total revenue, the catchment associated with water use is, it was around about six billion. Um, this, this is um, uh, how that increases, which is hardly any if you have an effective water trading system. That's one of the things you looked at. Uh, this is what the value is if there's no mining. So you see immediately that about five billion of that revenue comes from mining. Only one billion comes from all the other industries in this catchment, despite mining occupying a very, very small uh, footprint. Um, the water scarcity cost is just um, the total amount of money. Um, if, if, if everyone's water demand was met 100%, then that would be the extra revenue uh, generated in the catchment. So that looks very small, but remember that that's averaged over all the water users, and it's averaged all, over all the years of his modeling, which I think was 17 years. So in other words, in drought years, that value is much, much higher and could be a very uh, even for mining, it's a very significant amount, but even more so for agriculture, if you think the difference between a farmer surviving or, or going into bankruptcy. This is the, another example of the output. So you just get, um, you, you can actually get time series over the 17 years of simulation that show which years and when in the year the, the deficits uh, come. And that, that uh, when in the year deficits come turned out to be uh, informed, so we'll see some of the results, but here we are. Um, so you can see here, this is the percentage of uh, demands covered, and this is how it varies uh, seasonally, and this is climate scenarios. So the, the, the green one there is the current condition, the current temperatures and the climate. And you can see here that the deficits um, are quite are particularly high at this time of year. So this is, um, um, this is the winter period where the snow melt hasn't started yet. So in other words, the precipitation is not very high, and what precipitation there is stays on the, much of it stays on the mountain, the snow. Um, so it's in this dry season that the deficits are experienced. And one of the interesting outcomes is that uh, climate change, under one climate change scenario where the temperatures go up two degrees, uh, actually produces positive outcomes because uh, the snow melt happens earlier in the year, and uh, that covers some of these, um, these dry seasons where traditionally there's water of deficits. It has the opposite effect other times of the year, but overall has a net positive uh, effect. And that's seen in the water scarcity cost, where we look at these climate scenarios, and um, uh, so a lower water scarcity cost is good, and it actually uh, starts to drop from the current condition um, as the temperatures um, increase. If temperatures increase too much, then um, it goes the other um, way because associated with this increases in temperatures is actually lower amounts of, of precipitation. Okay, so just to um, conclude on that, um, so the, the insights from this is that um, um, as we expected, uh, mining uh, actually completely dominates uh, the economic value of water in this catchment. And really, in terms of um, the management of water and catchment, there's no good economic case for um, the mine either voluntarily sharing its water with other users in the catchment or um, the government forcing the mine to share. Uh, the real value for the mine, of course, is more the reputational issues and um, presenting itself as a responsible user and responsible sharer of water. In, in the catchment. So that, that is one of the main, the main messages that came out. Okay, on to uh, my third case study. So this is uh, Nena Bulovic's PhD, and again, this is significantly different. And this, this is a nice example, I think, of um, what mining companies can actually contribute to fundamental science. Um, because mining companies hold, in some areas, hold some of the best data sets in the world. 
and SMI has a particular advantage, is that we've got relatively easy access to these data sets. So this research is, is nothing, is, has very little um, benefits in terms of um, mining operations. The, the benefits are um, from the mining operations that provide us the data to the broader uh, science community. Uh, it's about climate in the Andes, as you might gather from this illustration. So here's the Andes. Um, the, the climate of the Andes is complex uh, because it's affected by numerous uh, weather systems, and these weather systems are quite dynamic. They're affected by uh, El Nino oscillation, and they're uh, predicted to be affected by climate change. So in particular, we're looking at the tropical Andes, which is uh, in Peru, round about up here. And uh, this is um, heavily affected by the, uh, the continental low-level jet, which uh, comes across um, Brazil and, and, and down on the, the eastern side of the Andes. And there's a very strong precipitation gradient up from very high rainfall down here to a uh, very low rainfall on, in the peaks in the Andes. Um, but that's very variable, and also it's susceptible to climate change impacts. So there's a lot of interest in understanding um, how that, that might change in the future. The other big issue in the high Andes is there's hardly any wind gauges. Uh, so mine companies and all other water users and managers of catchments have this problem that they're required to make some um, estimates of water resources for planning purposes, uh, but they just don't have that precipitation data at these high elevations that they need. And that's simply because it's so difficult to actually install and maintain um, accurate gauges up there. Um, the case study is the Antamina mine. Um, so this is this is the Antamina mine. It's uh, the elevation of the mine is is between about 3,500 and 4,500 meters uh, above sea level. So it's very high elevation. It's in the tropical Andes, so there's not much snow. Uh, it's it's principally just precipitation. It's around about uh, a thousand, just less than a thousand millimeters per year, uh, and it's very steep, uh, complex topography. Um, now, the, the Antamina mine has a remarkable uh, network of weather stations. They, they've got 17 weather stations in and around the mine, <laughs> and, and that's. It's very, very unusual to have that density of weather stations, and it's even more unusual, in fact, we think it's unique to have that density of weather stations high up in the Andes. <clears throat> and furthermore, no other research groups in the world have actually accessed this data set and used it for fundamental climate research. So NEN is in a very, uh, very strong position to actually make some major contributions here. Uh, you'll see this, um, this is the highest weather station, it's at 4,550 meters or something like that. And these weather stations are very well maintained. Um, you know, you, you can see that um, despite being so high up in the Andes, there's extreme security precautions to protect the equipment uh, from animals and from people. And in fact, they've, at most of these sites, most of the 17 sites, they've got a full-time security guard who just sits there and, and, and uh, oversees and maintains the equipment. I don't know, probably some of you read the Antamina mine, but it's, for me, it's way different from any mines in Australia because they've just got thousands of people running around doing everything that would be automated here, which may be good or may be bad, I don't know. Uh, this, is the, this chart here shows the, the data coverage of these 17 stations. So um, this is, uh, it, the measurements start back in around about 1990 and, um, and, and continue to today. But you can see that actually most of the stations were only implemented in uh, around about uh, 2017. Um, so really, really the research questions that we can most easily look at are research questions regarding um, that we can answer with relatively short, a few years of data, and more are looking at spatial variability of the precipitation rather than any long-term trend. But what NEN is focusing on so far is um, um, satellite estimation of precipitation. Uh, so as I said before, it's very rare um, that an area has, has such good measurement of the precipitation on the ground. Primarily, these areas rely on satellite estimation of rainfall. So that works with basically um, either infrared or microwave uh, sensors up on satellites. 
Um, this is the most recent satellite from uh, NASA. Uh, so it's got two uh, very advanced uh, microwave, uh, active microwaves. So it pulses down microwave at uh, different frequencies and it looks for uh, the strength and the and frequency shifts in the, in the signals coming back. And, and that uh, can be related to uh, precipitation rates. Not very accurately, as we'll see, but can. Uh, now, these satellites only pass over a particular area uh, once every few days. Um, and, and therefore, what they do is there's actually a cluster of satellites. So there's about, NASA uh, uses about um, uh, 12 satellites in this system, uh, which give re reasonably comprehensive coverage, both in time and space, over the whole, uh, almost the whole world. But there are significant questions about the accuracy of this. Uh, how, how well does it actually estimate precipitation? And in particular, in the past, uh, people have questioned the accuracy um, for low precipitation rates and for high altitudes and, and steep terrains. And both of these apply to the Antonino Mine site. So most of the rainfall that falls there uh, is, is quite light rain. You know, it's not heavy storms like Queensland. It's like drizzle that we're used to getting in Scotland. And it just keeps going for days or weeks on end. So it's an ideal site to, uh, to evaluate some of these, um, these questions that people uh, have asked. Uh, this is just uh, some outputs from, from uh, NASA's uh, uh, satellite system. Um, so it has, a, it has an early stage estimation. So that means within a few hours, um, you can, they'll process satellite data. They'll put it online so you can actually see what the rainfall was a few hours ago over very large spatial scales. This is the whole crew. Um, and then they have a late stage and a final stage where they actually do some calibration and refinement of the estimate. Um, and in principle, that makes the estimates better. But you may have to wait a few days or a few months before you can, you can see these. Um, now, fortunately for us, so, so these um, satellite systems operate on grids. And the grid squares for the, um, the NASA mission are uh, 0.1 degree by 0.1 degree. That's about 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers. Um, so they give you precipitation on the scale of, of that grid. And uh, luckily for us, the grid uh, actually um, encompasses 16 of the 17 precipitation stations at Imer. So not only do we have a very high density, we've got a very, very good um, ground-based <coughs> estimate of what the average precipitation in this grid is. So a very good basis. Uh, for comparing. Okay, so just, just some uh, initial results. Uh, Nen is still busy working on this. But uh, this is, uh, this is the, the ground-based precipitation average over the whole of the, the grid square, um, which shows you, you, obviously, you get a wet season, dry season, wet season, dry season. Uh, it's relatively uh, uniform uh, between the years so far. And then this is the, the final stage, the early stage, and the late stage estimation from NASA's uh, satellite mission. Um, so you see uh, the final stage one is supposed to be the best, and it is, um, but very significantly underestimates the precipitation here. Um, and that's important for practical purposes um, because, as I said, people are relying on these precipitation estimates for water resources studies. And in fact, in these catchments, much of the water is actually generated in these upland areas. So these are the key water supply areas of Peru. Um, and so are the key inputs to, to water resources models. Now, the reason why it does this is exactly as people thought that it doesn't capture well the very low precipitation, the very low um, rates of precipitation. It does quite well when there's really big events. Uh, but that drizzle that happens over days and days and months and months, it, it doesn't pick up that very well. And it also underestimates the, um, the number of days that it's actually raining. Uh, and that's uh, closely related to the, to the last one. Uh, so what then is going to do next? Well, and, and the, reason, the reason why it doesn't do well, part of the reason is because it's, um, this uh, final stage um, product is actually calibrated on, on ground gauges. But because almost all of these gauges are down in the valleys, where it's relatively easy, where there's times and it's relatively e easy for them to be maintained. Um, that means there's significant underestimation of the ground-based precipitation. So what they're using as the truth isn't actually the truth, because they're not measuring the precipitation high up in the, in the mountains, such as at the Antonina site. OK, so a, 
so I've, I've got a few minutes left, so I'm going to go on to my fourth uh, case study. And um, this is work we've been, is being led by the Chile office. Um, and, and this is a very interesting topic on um, um, the proliferation of seawater supplies to, to mines in northern Chile. And it raises some very interesting search questions. And we've been working on this almost since I arrived at Swimmy uh, through a series of uh, internships and master's projects. And uh, it was only last year that the office in Chile had a very significant funded project on this topic, which was great. Uh, so this is some of the early uh, work we did uh, a few years ago, where we said, OK, this, this is the Antofagasta region in, in Chile. There's about uh, 30 copper mines or so there. Uh, they're all short of water, and some of them are beginning to build seawater supply pipelines. And Escondida is a good example. Uh, it's up at more than 3,000 meters elevation, and I think around about 150 kilometers the coast. And as I said, we've invested three and a half billion dollars in a supplemental water supply. Um, and now the same has happened at around about other seven other mines already, and there's around about seven or eight other mines are well advanced in planning of their supplies. So actually a few years ago before all this happened though we were actually thinking about well theoretically what would be the optimal network of seawater supply that would supply water to all these mines. So what, what's the point of each mine planning its own seawater supply? Let's see what we can how we can do better. So we came up with various various extreme scenarios. This is a scenario where there's only one desal plant and it's supplying all the mines, which is obviously nonsense, but in the end uh, much we came up with the optimal uh, balance between the number of desal plants um, and, and the length of pipeline involved. And then we did uh, another project, we actually looked at the operational savings to the mines, and this was focusing on the Chucky Kamata cluster of mines, um, showing that um, um, there's um, very significant savings in actually optimizing uh, a network of, of um, seawater supply, rather than doing one individually for each mine. And the primary beneficiaries, of course, are these small mines, which, which would never have the opportunity to build their own uh, infrastructure for seawater supply uh, because they don't have the, the revenue levels to support it. Um, and, and, but the bigger mines also beneficiaries, but, but not so much because they are um, realistically doing it themselves. Okay, so this is the, the this is the more major project that happened last year um, based at our, out of our office in Chile. So these are three of the pipelines that have been built or are being built at the moment. Uh, so Chucky Kamata, uh, Spence, and, and Escondida in red. Um, so what we were asked to uh, look at um, was um, what would be the, would there be any benefits, and what would these benefits be of actually uh, connecting up these three uh, supplies with a high altitude transverse pipeline? So much of the cost, much of the operational cost of these ones is the fact you're pumping up lots of seawater from sea level to uh, perhaps 3,000 meters. So in principle, if you've got a pipeline that follows the contours, uh, your, your costs are much, much reduced. And what this could do is pick up some of these other mines that don't yet have our seawater supplies, and also could provide some redundancy, oops, redundancy in the system, uh, so that, for example, any failure of the pipeline to um, failure of the pipeline to Spence uh, could that there would be a backup supply. Uh, so that so there's a 100-page report uh, on this that's come out of the office in Chile. That at the moment we're we're planning how to publish that and get the necessary permissions to do that. Uh, now, how we follow that up is, is starting to think ahead and looking at the third region of Chile, which is the Atacama region, because as yet it doesn't have any, I don't think there's any seawater supplies to the mines, but it's inevitable it's going to happen, because, because the mines further north have found it's a good business case, it's going to happen further south. So we start thinking, well, um, what's the opportunity here? How can we learn from the lessons further north about suboptimality in these networks and, and actually produce something a bit more optimal? And there's actually interest from the private sector water supply companies in building a central reservoir and then uh, selling the water. So they build the desal plant, they build the reservoir, they build the pipelines, and then they sell the water to the mines and to other users. Uh, so we're trying to uh, um, get some business from them and say, well, we can actually optimize these pipelines and we can actually demonstrate the cost savings that would happen, uh, as well as increased reliability of uh, supply. 
Uh, Norte Abierto is the is, is one of the target mines. So this is a mine that's under planning, and it's uh, their major issue is water supply. Uh, the mine thinks that they're too high up in the Andes to have an economical seawater pipeline. So the question is, if this, if, if this water is provided by a third party at a reduced cost, because they're supplying other customers as well, uh, how much more feasible that uh, will become. The other thing we've been doing on seawater supply um, that I started a couple of years ago was thinking about financial risks. So I, I found it hard to believe that Escondida could invest three and a half billion in a seawater supply at very low financial risk. So what we did is we started to look at some, and this isn't Escondida, by the way, this is an anonymous mine because these kind of results are very sensitive. Um, so we looked at scenarios of the next 27 years of copper prices. Uh, so this is from the literature. I looked at scenarios of electricity prices in Chile and looked at scenarios of water regulations that affect the, the actual freshwater deficits uh, for these mines. Um, and the relevance of this, if, if in actual fact there's going to be no freshwater deficits, then any investment in seawater supply arguably is a wasted investment from a financial perspective. So what you get out of this analysis, you do some Monte Carlo analysis randomly sampling these different scenarios under various uh, assumptions, and um, you get results which show the net financial benefit of investing in the seawater supply as a probability distribution. Um, um, so what I found was that actually the expected uh, financial benefits are quite modest, um, perhaps uh, around about, uh, on average, about 600, um, 600 million uh, dollars, which over the lifespan of a big mine isn't, isn't a lot of money, right? Uh, and then there was around about 40% probability they would actually make a loss um, from, the, from the investment. Uh, this is, this, um, this is something else that we're still working on and trying to uh, refine these scenarios a bit so that we can actually publish it as a, as a meaningful uh, analysis. Okay, so just some concluding thoughts from all of that, um, from each of these projects. Uh, so, so in general terms, uh, mine companies are, in, are focusing more on their interactions with regions uh, because they are under a lot, a lot of pressure um, from society and from their funders to be what we call water stewards. Uh, so just like any other large-scale water user in the catchment uh, with large land footprints, they're expected to actually protect the water resources of the downstream users and where possible contribute positively. <coughs> um, just some thoughts from the, these example projects. Uh, salt generation from mine waste. So we're looking at scales of around about 100 years and to me it's interesting is that adequate. If you look at, you look at industries like the nuclear industry, they look 10,000 years into the future. They actually look at how they're in, in terms of waste, nuclear waste repositories, they look at how their infrastructure will degrade on time scales of 10,000 years, and then after 10,000 years, they have to do some simulations to see what would actually happen to their wastes once that infrastructure has, has degraded. Uh, mining companies are way, way, way behind that, and they're thinking, they're struggling to think 100 years into the future. Um, so, thoughts on regional water economics. Uh, so, as I mentioned, um, there's little uh, clear direct economic benefit of um, mines sharing water more with people in the catchment because these other users have comparably a little, um, make comparably little economic value from the water. Uh, the question for us is, is how do we integrate the other values that are important, the social values, the cultural values, the environmental values of, of water. Um, because until we do that, then we can't really build a case for for mining companies to be uh, better water stewards. Precipitation in the high Andes, well, it's a, it, we benefit a lot in this project from our efforts to um, get a company to share this valuable data. And there's the question that always comes up is, is how much data should the mining companies be sharing? Should, it, should all their environmental data just be publicly available or, or should it not? Um, so there's interesting questions of, of how uh, companies can actually achieve the right balance of, of sharing the data. And the fourth one, um, the future of seawater supply. So in my view, it's going to become more and more common uh, that um, whole regions will have networks of seawater supply. So we're, we're kind of uh, started doing that in, in the Brisbane area with, with um, joining up the seawater, the desal plant with the other water infrastructure. Um, I think it's likely in the future that will become much more common. And the, and the case study in, in North Chile is really a unique case study to think about some of the risks and opportunities 
Thank you.